Hi, welcome back to the bench. Um, I'm going to be doing a series of videos on this scope, uh, as I said before, um, and unfortunately, uh, they might be a little bit um, out of sync, out of order, if you will, uh, and that's purely because I've been doing work on it, uh, you know, here and there. So sometimes um, I'll have sort of troubleshooted a part of it, and I'm going to go back and shoot some video to sort of. Uh, show where the, you know, what I've done and whatnot. So this is a good example of that, where I've done quite a bit of work actually just, you know, sort of smoking out where some of the issues are as well as verifying certain things that, you know, make sure that work that work and don't work. So what I'd like to, wanted to do today was uh, sort of uh, give you an idea of where the problem is, or at least what visually what the problem looks like. And um, then start to just go a little bit into, uh, you know, where I, where we, I think the issue may be. Um, and a bit, uh, just a little bit on bow, but what I'm going to actually do, what the next step is to tackle that problem, or to try and solve the problem. So um, right now I've got uh, two of the vertical uh, amplifier plugins in, uh, one in the uh, vertical, one of the vertical slots base, and one in the tie base. This should normally give us, uh, like I'd shown before, um, sort of an XY plot, if it was working. And right now the, the only thing that's uh, not um, sort of uh, kosher, if you will, with this scope is that I've uh, removed the GPIB board because that's a real pain in the butt to work more with stuff with it in there. So I just removed it. It's, it, won't, it won't affect anything in the scope. The behaviors in the front panel is identical with or without the board in it installed. And um, that's that. So when you power up, this is what happens. CRT lights up. And as I'd shown before, the actual uh, trace uh, in the analog section is working correctly. So this is purely a digital problem, uh, most likely. And uh, this is where it stops and uh, freezes, if you will, uh, and shows a error message. Now the error message here is all the lights lit on the vertical mode uh, section with only the chop uh, button lit on the horizontal mode. If you go into the service manual, that actually shows that there's a problem with the ROM uh, main program, main, uh, main MPU board. Um, and it's not too specific. It basically says, uh, in, you know, sort of paraphrasing it, there's a problem, I couldn't load my main program. Um, great, so you know, <laughs> where do you go from there, right? Um, so th this coupled with the other clue that uh, the guy that originally had the scope uh, who did some work on replacing the ROMs, he figured maybe there's something else that wasn't quite going right, right with the ROMs uh, and there were some steps that he wanted to take which he never ended up doing to try and verify that. So if you push the, uh, any button actually, it sets to this and this is the final state. This, the scope doesn't make any more, doesn't do anything more after this stays like that. Um, at that point this is where you're at. So why don't we, uh, so that, that's the problem. At least that's the visual end user manifestation of the problem. So I'm going to uh, reset the, uh, the, the view here a little bit uh, so you can see what's going on over uh, over here with all the uh, boards and the internals. And uh, let's go take a look and explore a bit deeper. All right, so here we are with the uh, scope on the bench. Uh, and as you can see, it pretty much fills up my bench. I don't have a huge bench, um, but it's pretty much the only project that'll, <laughs> that'll fit on it at this point in time. And there's a bit of a space over here on the right hand side, but not much. So um, when you open this up, uh, all of the boards, the digital boards are sort of, uh, well, digital slash analog boards are uh, sort of uh, mounted here in, in this uh, back plane. And um, I have quite a few of the, uh, well, quite a few, I've got the entire service menu, but I have quite a few of the actual schematics of each of these boards and whatnot um, uh, printed out and blown up onto four sheets of paper, sort of cut, to, you know, cut and taped together um, to sort of facilitate trying to figure out, you know, trying to sort my head for my tail from all these uh, you know the different connections and the interconnects and whatnot so uh, you've got your main uh, motherboard if you will uh, here there's also another main board here which is like a back plane which all the plugins fit into and um, they are connected I'm afraid exactly how anyway there's there's a connection mechanism here uh, which I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head for the moment so there's two boards here that we're interested in for the moment. So I'm going to pull out the MPU board first. All right, this will make this potentially a little bit easier to see. 
So we've got the MPU board here, and uh, it's uh, so the processor is a TMS nine thousand. Yes, TMS nine thousand, and um, uh, there's a few things on this board. So there's, I, I, I don't remember. Uh, no, I never. I, I shot some video, uh, which I'll probably cut together maybe later on. Um, sort of going through the block diagram a little bit about how this works. Uh, it, it will make more sense now that now that I actually understand how it works. Uh, before it probably would have been really confusing. So maybe I'll just end up reshooting that. But essentially, um, this is where it. Uh, you know, we have the microprocessor here. Um, and it is a microprocessor, so it's got uh, address to you know it's got a, 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 a memory space and address space, uh, and it's got address encoders and decoders, um, and it, it it's pretty much a, a, a real quote unquote computer, um, you know not not really like a microcontroller at all where all these things are integrated together. Um, so some when you're looking at this like this this architecture starts feeling a bit more familiar a bit you know a bit more towards like the PCs of the 80s or whatever it's sort of that it's got that flavor. Um, so the interesting thing here, of course, on this board is are the address lines, um, and that'll come be more apparent as to why uh, in a little bit. But um, <clears throat> this board communicates with uh, the other various boards in the, in the system, and one of those boards is the ROM. Board. And the ROM board, so this uh, microprocessor has no onboard flash. So if you're used to using an Arduino, for example, so an AVR or an ARM chip or something like that, you'd be, uh, you know, you'd say, oh, well, I'll flash the chip, right? So if you get, you know, you get one of these little junkers right here, and uh, the, the program is stored directly on board the ARM chip. And um, on this guy, it's not the way it works at all. On this guy, there's the yeah, the program stored external, and you know the instructions are loaded over the, uh, they're fetched, and you know, the address is dropped on the address bus, and the instructions and data are read over the data bus into, uh, you know, various registers and whatnot on here, and they're executed. Um, very, very, very old, old, a very 80s flavor, very you know, uh, beginning of the uh, computing age flavor of of, of computation and uh, and. Uh, how computers are designed and built in that architecture, but it's it's very cool. It's very uh, it's very comfortable for me at any rate. Um, so this so the the ROM board is really important because the ROM board stores the program for this uh, entire scope, and the ROM board has which is right here um, this this card right here, and I'll pull that on a second. The ROM board has the program stored in a series of uh, banks. And that program uh, uh, maps to an address space that's accessible by this processor. So this this processor, when it starts up, it's going to uh, you know do whatever very small amounts of, uh, of initialization it does. It's going to set its instruction pointer, which would normally be at address zero. Uh, it might actually be a little bit different for this one. I forget because uh, I don't. I, I was looking at the data sheet for this uh, processor, but suffice to say the the concept's still the same. It'll set it to some default start address. Drop it'll drop that address or write that address to the address lines on the bus, and those address lines will uh, activate the ROM board uh, through a decoding logic, which I'll show you in a second, uh, which will uh, basically make the ROM board uh, you know feed those address signals into one of the various banks, which will have been selected by the address, and the data will then be presented and latched onto the um, uh, data bus, which will then be read back into the processor. So in, the case, in this case, for example, it might be, uh, I'm pulling this a little, a little out of my head, but it may be, for example, organized by, you know, uh, the first word, which is 16 bits on this machine, is uh, is read in, and that's the instruction, and the second word is the data, that kind of stuff, anyway, whatever. So, um, that, that's how this, you know, this, this microprocessor board basically functions, you know, sort of a, at a very, very high level. Uh, and that's sort of how the interaction between the MPU board and the ROM board, uh, you know, what that what that interaction and that relationship is. For so, if, in theory, um, if this thing has a problem reading the program out, it could be a bunch of different things. The first place to start looking, of course, is the ROM board because there may be something wrong with either the ROMs, what the latches, something on there. Uh, so the decoder logic, for example, something that might not be working properly, so that when the processor writes an address onto the address bus, the ROM board is not reading it back correctly. Um, so that's sort of the first thing to check. Um, and to do that, um, 
you know, the, well, one of the basic, one of the one of the one of the basic things we want may want to do is read the firmware to see what uh, what's going on, and you can sort of see now, maybe already you can sort of see the little yellow, uh, sorry, orange labels there. They might give it away, but so let's go ahead and we'll put this back in for the moment. Um, the bodge wires on there on this board are mine, and they serve a very particular purpose, which I will get into in a second. I want to put this back in sort of correct. There, there we go. Um, right, and so this is why, of course, I took the GPIB card out because it made pulling the ROM board out very annoying because you have to always undo this cable here and then flip it over and pull this board out. So this is the ROM board, uh, and immediately you can see that these are probably not factory default, <laughs> um, nor is the Q-tip. <laughs> um, so when I got the scope, uh, I don't know exactly the story in terms of um, why this mod was done. Uh, it could be because the ROMs were bad, it could be because uh, the guy that got it was worried that that's where the problem started from. So whatever the reason, he decided to uh, go ahead and remove uh, remove the, uh, I'm not sure if they were in uh, um, sockets, but anyway, he removed the chips uh, and possibly the sockets if they were there and designed a small little adapter board that, um, because of course you can't get these ROM chips anymore, um, or these ROM chips I should say, and he designed a small adapter where they went from uh, the, the package format you can he could get, which is a PLCC. I'm just going to give you a finger pointer here. Be useful, rather than my finger sticking all the time. Um, so these ROM chips are still available. I forget what they are off the top of my head. Uh, actually, it's written here. They're a 28C64. So I think it's 64 bit, a uh, 64K bit, uh, which is like 8K words or something like that. Yes, it's 18k, uh, six, sorry, 16k, pardon me. And I think it's 8k words, because the word on the system is uh, 16 bits. But, um, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, 8k bits, uh, bytes, pardon me, and 4k words. Anyway, whatever it is, um, you can get the ROMs, uh, but in a different package. So he just designed a small adapter board for that. Uh, you know, all that to say, not that big a deal. There's a few features here that are kind of interesting. So the first one is uh, there's two banks. So these, each of these uh, banks here, these these two pairs of ROMs, I uh, represent a single bank, and um, one of them, and I forget which one it is, uh, stores the high or the the high uh, byte of the word, and the second one stores the low boy byte of the word. So for example, if there's four K four K words here. Um, that means um, this one would store the high order byte and this one would store the low order byte of each word. Uh, so the first 8 bits and the second 18, uh, 8 bits of the 16 bits. And the same for this, these two chips here which are the second bank. So there's two banks here. Um, the third bank here, I forget exactly what it was. I believe this is a user storable EEPROM or something like that. And uh, here we have um, that's, they're not the patrons, but they store they store a bunch of information in, in these guys as well. I, I, forget, I forget exactly what they're called. I have to go look it up. Um, and this socket here, which is cons conspicuously has a chip missing, is actually uh, a very interesting uh, thing. It's called uh, the patron or the field programmable patron or something like that. And uh, the purpose of this guy was very very fun because what happens is when when the uh, and of course you have your connector here and a bunch of these latches here. When an address is presented on the address bus of this uh, of the scope, the patron uh, has access to all of those address lines. Maybe actually, more specifically, a set of those address lines. And inside the patron, it will have a list of instructions, um, and though uh, sorry, well, a list of memory locations, I should say. So when each when, when uh, an address is presented that matches an address inside this patron, the patron will disable and override the address to go fetch that uh, instruction out of this bank. So like for example, if we decide that uh, um, uh, once this is in the field, we find a bug uh, in the software, right? And, 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 and to be sure, these, these four EEPROMs uh, are storing the firmware or the software that runs the scope. So if we found a bug in this, say for example, it address uh, 1000 hex. Um, um, when that address is presented on these address lines, the F, uh, the the the, the patron would would recognize that address and realize that that should be remapped to say I don't know address zero on the patron 
uh, well, that's, that's actually the patch ROM control logic, but anyway, the actual ROMs that store the actual patch code. So what would end up happening is it would override the addresses that are presented onto these ROMs here to disable the bank that's that's being selected. So let's say this bank and enable the patch ROM bank with the correct address on here. And that would allow the, the uh, microprocessor board to now read address 1000 hex, but that instead of coming from the EEPROM bank here, would come from the patch ROM instead because of this. Now, when uh, the guy that uh, uh, gave me the scope, uh, when he did these mods, what he did was he said, because essentially what they're doing here is they're basically doing a merge, right? They're taking a, a, a patch, essentially a set, of, a set of memory locations here, and merging them seamlessly, uh, transparently to this to the microprocessor board. Um, so when you access these ROM, these these EEPROMs, so you can you'll you'll access the the patch instructions automatically. So what he did was he simply said, okay, well I'll replace the four. EEPROMs, and I'll burn in a version of the software, the firmware that has these patch opcode, these patch instructions already pre-applied. So this is as if these have already the, all the instructions already updated in them. Uh, so which that removes the need of having this patch ROM controller as well as the patch ROMs. Now the patch ROMs are used for other things other than just uh, instructions, like uh, updated instructions. Um, they're also used for some configuration settings. So you didn't, you, you can't remove these. You, these are needed. Um, and that's that. So he he made this modification. He uh, he, you know, burned these these, these four EEPROMs, dropped the board in, and it didn't. It may it may boot up now. I don't remember. I don't remember the initial uh, state that he got it in. Whether it didn't boot up at all, and when he did this, it now got to the point where we're seeing right now on the front panel. I'll have to ask him. But um, this is where we are. So we we have his modification that he did here, along with what looks like a little bit of repair on here and here. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see if we can try and get in close. Try and yeah, there we go. So you can see, you can see uh, there's some uh, repair work that's done there. I don't know if you can see the angle, but it looks like there's some uh, soldered uh, leads uh, or wires that were were soldered soldered onto the uh, IC leads to sort of uh, help them uh, interface better or make contact on the slots in the socket. Sorry. So, oops, wrong way, there we go. Um, so there was a repair there too. So in his mind, what he wasn't 100% sure of was whether or not he'd written these ROMs properly, whether they read out correctly, maybe there were something else wrong, wrong with them. Um, so he, the next step he was gonna take was he was going to uh, write, some, uh, write, write a quick uh, debugger probe that would go ahead and plug in here. Uh, in fact, it was his, in, his intent was to use this header right here, plug into here and actually read uh, from the you know directly from the bus because some of this this goes this has access to the address and the data bus this header right here so it's a debug header for the MPU card um, and read and try and read these ROMs directly sort of put the whole system in reset so that the uh, microprocessor wouldn't start up it would just be held held there dormant um, and then he could then go ahead and uh, poke values on the address bus and read values back off the data bus 